so just to interrupt you guys, I think um, given that we're all here now and I think we've all got vision and vocals, we can probably make a start. Um, we're sure there'll be some more people joining as we go through. Um, but let's uh, make a start because we're, we're fairly pressed for time. So um, good afternoon, everybody. My name's Andrew Crane from the University of Bath. And I'm moderating this session on research on responsible management, uh, asking kind of where are we heading? And to do that, we've, we've got a whole series of, of editors of journals, associate editors and editors who are going to be talking us through these issues. We're going to be talking, you know, most of the, the prime conference is about education, but we're going to be talking about the kind of research side of that, both kind of research and responsible business in general, but also about how it intersects with responsible management education. And to do that, we've got our three panelists. Um, we have a last minute replacement. We were going to have Paul Hibbert, the incoming editor of the Academy of Management, Learning and Education, in his place, um, who I'm sure is going to be even better than Paul would have been, is going to be Oliver Lush. Uh, Oliver is from the University of Manchester and is an incoming associate editor at the Academy of Management, Learning and Education. That's right, Oliver. Thank you, Andy. Yes. Great. Uh, we also have Emma Bell. Emma is at the Open University in the UK and is a co-editor in chief at the journal Management Learning. And we have Colin Higgins, who's joining us from Deakin University in Australia, uh, who is one of the co-editors at Business and Society. Uh, thank you for joining us, Colin. I know it's very early in the morning there as well. So wonderful for you to be tuning in at this late hour. It's good to be here. Um, so we're going to run through for about a half an hour of discussion with me and the editors, and then we're going to open it out to questions that come through uh, in the Q&A. So please post some questions as we're going through if you have them, and I'll pick some of those up um, as we get towards the, the last part of the session. I mean, just to, so that everyone is aware of what, what type of journals they are that, that, that are being represented here on, on, the, on the panel, I wonder if you could all just give a brief introduction, very brief, about what the kind of scope is of, of your journal, what type of research that you publish. Um, Colin, you want to start? Tell us a little bit about Business and Society. Sure. So Business and Societies, I think many of you will be aware, it's been around for 60 years, coming up for the 60th uh, volume next year, uh, publishes original research that makes a theoretical contribution to that relationship between business and society broadly defined um, and so by theoretical contribution we're looking for work that explains a phenomenon that ex that talks about impact effects of the various ways in which business organizations have some kind of impact or effect on society and how the sorts of things that are happening in society or in the community in which businesses operate, how those in turn affect how managers make sense of what they do and the structure and operations of their organization. So the territory has typically been around ethics, governance, stakeholder, CSR, etc. Yeah. Do you also publish any research on education, on responsible management education? We haven't really i did have a look just over the last few days we've published only two articles in the last decade um, mm -hmm. that have really touched on management education so mm -hmm. i know there's some questions coming up which i'm happy to kind of talk a little bit yeah, more yeah. about that that later it hasn't been a big focus of our, what we have published um, i would like to see more of it um, and i've got some thoughts about how and why we haven't had such a big footprint in this space Okay, uh, we'll dig into those later. Um, mm. Emma, tell us a little bit about Management Learning. So Management Learning was founded in 1970, so um, getting on for as old as business and society. We celebrated our 50th anniversary last year. And it was originally set up in order to um, think about the development and learning of business school educators, as well as managers and managerial learning. And since then, it's expanded, extended um, its remit so that it now focuses on all aspects of organizational learning, in addition to issues related to education, including education in the business school. So it encompasses 
both learning as in organizations as well as educational um, aspects. And two key aspects that I'd, I'd emphasize about the journal remit. One is the critical nature of, of its research um, profile. So it doesn't shy away from thinking about the um, oppressive, exploitative aspects of uh, power uh, that exist, not only in wider society and, and, and that conspire against responsible management, but also in the business school. And um, we've recently had, for example, a special issue entitled The Performative University. And that really is quite a hard hitting special issue that talks about some of the practices within the academy that make it difficult for academics to act responsibly. So I think that critical aspect is something that I would emphasize. And the second aspect is the reflexive nature of work in the journal. And what that means is that we're interested in uh, papers that think about the, the author's own situated position and um, that write, are written in a way that it invites reflexive analysis. It means that academics, educators themselves are reflective practitioners as well as the managers that they educate. And so there are various ways in which that comes through. Great. Oliver, I realise that you're only recently or about to move into a position on the editorial team at, at AMLE, uh, but obviously you've, um, you've been involved with the journal before um, as a reviewer, reader, author, etc. and someone that's very um, experienced in this field too. Do you want to tell us a little bit about the journal and its Yes, scope? yes, I uh, will try to. I must say not only that I haven't been uh, an editor of the journal for a long time, but also that I didn't know about this call about 40 minutes before uh, <laughs> before that. So uh, please apologize my very superficial nature of the introduction to the, to the journal here. So um, Academy of Management Lear Learning and Education, AMLE, um, AOM's uh, um, journal interested in anything that has to do with learning, education, and business schools particularly. So uh, I think one thing that makes the journal, uh, I don't want to say unique, but it's a, it's a strong focus that probably people wouldn't normally guess from the name, is uh, the management of education and the organizational aspects uh, of business schools as well. Um, and in terms of the, uh, the connection to the responsible management education uh, context, I think there's quite a long uh, but also interesting history in the journal because on the one hand, um, I think one of the very first interviews with one of the, the previous heads of Prime was published in AMLE. Um, there has been a resource collection uh, explicitly dedicated to, to UN Prime. I think there, those were about 10 uh, different reviews or reviews of core resources. Uh, and many of the editors have been very involved in, in prior Hibbert, who, who is the editor-in-chief now, uh, and published on the topic itself. But uh, the interesting thing there is that I, to my knowledge, we don't have a single, um, uh, a, a single normal journal, I mean, research article on responsible management education that's explicitly framed as responsible management education. While, of course, we do have many articles related to ethics, responsibility, sustainability, plus education. But... Uh, this explicit framing is something that I, I would find interesting to see in the future um, as well. Okay, great. I mean, just talking more generally about research on responsible business, right, about CSR, business ethics, sustainability. I mean, Colin, have you seen changes over the, mm. over the years in terms of what, how much of that research is coming out, how much is getting published, um, <clears throat> what the focus is? Have those things yeah. changed? So I think there's been quite a bit of change. I think really the the early days and probably up until about 15 or 20 years ago, a lot of the business and society CSR literature was very descriptive. It was very much what is this thing called CSR and how do we make sense of it? What, How can we label different activities that we observe? And I think over the last 15 to 20 years, it had the, the theorizing in this space has got a lot better. There's, um, and I think that's really been um, caused by the breadth in the field. So we, we have more scholars and more authors thinking about these issues now that have brought into the tent a wider range of theories and a wider range of theoretical perspectives. So we've certainly seen quite a shift in the sophistication of the analysis. We, we still do see a little bit around 
how many companies are doing X, Y, and Z from the KLD data. And we do still see a little bit coming through about trying to distinguish corporate social responsibility from corporate social performance. But I think we are seeing a lot greater depth now in terms of really unpacking what drives some of those relationships. I think the other really critical thing that we're, we're, we're observing much more now um, is about the target of the research work as well. When business and society started in the 60s leading into the 70s, it was really about getting business on board, bringing the business person to the table around socially responsible business and business ethics. Now it's much more critical about what business is actually doing because they have adopted the discourse. They are talking about CSR, it's it's inescapable now. So I think we've seen a shift in the target mm -hmm. of what we're trying to achieve through the business and society research as well. Um, and I think it's also, and therefore it's become a lot more critical, I think, the business and society literature is putting under the spotlight the sorts of things that managers are saying that organizations are doing that organizations stand for and the effects the broader socio-cultural effects that organizations have in this space um, and i think there's probably a bit more around um way things go in waves and, and we've certainly had a lot more of the blending of sustainability and green and natural environment work come into the CSR space as well um, and so those boundary issues present some challenges around how we might differentiate and, and brand the journal if you like in the space but at the same time it does open up much broader conversations we're seeing more around um, social entrepreneurship and responsible innovation and those sorts of things coming through now as well so certainly has changed quite substantially over the last 15 to 20 years and what's the trend line like in terms of the kind of number of submissions at the journal the kind of interest in, in the topic would you say yeah well look the submissions to the journal are growing substantially i think we're year on year we seem to be going up um quite quite substantially this year i think we're aiming we're on track to have about 700 or so submissions this year and i think partly that's because the impact factor is now very high for business and society and with the rankings game and the uh, the various national journal ranking systems business and society has been moving up quite rapidly through most of those so it's got a good brand in the market for publishing now if you like plus i think because of that breadth and how issues that were once very much confined to business and society and csr type spaces have spread into different domains and spread into different disciplines that's also bringing in much more interest in publishing that work in the journal mm. okay Emma, I mean, what about you know, turning a bit more towards responsible management education? Is this a topic that is getting greater attention amongst people that are publishing in management learning? I, I've had a look, uh, I guess, as Colin did, as to how many papers have been published recently, for example, focusing on the principles of responsible management education. And the answer is, is not that many. And like Colin, we'd like to see more work on that. Um, but one of the papers that was published recently um, in 2018 um, did something which I think is very important when considering these issues, which is um, problematized the very notion of responsibility and, and, and responsibility to whom and to what. Um, and it was based on a study where um, it was qualitative study, which is very typical of work published in management learning. Um, and it involved um, interviewing um, academics in a business school about their experience of the initiative and how they engaged with it and how they experienced their colleagues and their students engaging with it. Um, and, and, and I suppose there is a, a, a problem to this around understanding the risks labeling things in certain ways and um, the risk of them becoming empty signifiers. Um, and I think we're all aware of that but um, management learning tries to create a space where it's possible to um, express those doubts and concerns and reflect upon them in ways that are productive of change and that's what we see as 
as as very significant so i'd say that for for management learning the emphasis is not on that specific label per se of responsible management education but that through the the critical reflexive perspective and the fact that there are a number of papers every year that um, debate and, and consider aspects of learning such as action learning um, for example um, th there is a, 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 a an ethical um, deliberation process that the community within management learning um, appreciates and again how would you see the, the trend line does that seem to be a gradual increase over time or is it pretty much a, a kind of an ongoing consistent uh, interest would you say um i would say that the, that the label of sustainability isn't isn't particularly one that that management learning has has much uh published on um but um the the issue of the the ethics of learning uh about about responsibility and and the responsibilities that we have as educators um within the context of the university the pressures that um we're under in terms of the the university and and the wider societal responsibilities that we have um in the context of of climate change um and and um various other uh issues um that that are written about in the journal is, is very important. Oliver, let me turn to you in terms of AMLE, but also the, the, your kind of broader experience in this field mm. I know you've been editing is your handbook on responsible management education. Is this a topic that you see, um, is it difficult to get people interested in this, in publishing in, in this? Is it something that you yeah. see there's a kind of a huge perhaps supply that's not being met by journals in terms of a publication space, or is it is it more of a challenge to get people doing research in this area to get them inspired to, to try and yeah, publish it? Yeah, I, uh, in, in my experience, there's a lot of uh, interest in publishing in that space, particularly uh, uh, due, due to the increasing number of prime schools over the last 10 years. I think back then when I uh, was first in, in touch with Prime, it was probably about 100 schools, if I remember correctly. And uh, now I think we're up to somewhere 600, 700. Um, so, and, and, and very often schools try to uh, align their research agenda as well with uh, those topics and often frame them explicitly as that. Um, but at the same time, uh, something that I've heard from um, people who were in that associate editor role at AMLE before, uh, who were in charge of those typically of those incoming submissions. They would say that there was a lot coming in, but often it didn't have that theoretical angle that AMLE would be looking for. Um, so, that seem, so there seems to be a different mismatch between, uh, not, in, not in quantitative terms, but probably in uh, the kind of focus of the publications or, or manuscripts that are, that are coming in. Uh, one area though where I've seen that um, there, there increasingly is a match is the topic of responsible management. So without the learning or education angle where particularly the Journal of Business Ethics is actually uh, very successfully uh, uh, building up a, a very uh, uh, coherent and interconnected pipeline of articles related to responsible management that, that are explicitly framing it as responsible management, which then often comes with uh, certain conceptual preferences like uh, social practices perspectives uh, or, or a constructionist perspective or deep, deep empirical qualitative work. Um, so these seem to be increasingly a co coherent stream of research where actually those two uh, supply and demand uh, are meeting. And I think that's very encouraging. Let me dig a little deeper on that because I mean Colin mm. mentioned the business society focuses on papers that have a theoretical contribution. Emma talked about yeah. the importance of having a critical perspective on, on education and learning. Mm. And you mentioned also this kind of mismatch sometimes between papers yeah, that yeah. have a sufficient theoretical contribution. So what, what does that look like in in research that's on kind of responsible management education? Mm -hmm. What do we mean yeah, by so, theory? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I must say I haven't been in a uh, editorial role for responsible management education, but I can talk a little bit about the experience with a special issue we recently did with uh, Journal of Business Ethics on responsible mm -hmm. management learning. So more the, the workplace context and how uh, um, uh, management practitioners and academic practitioners interact. Uh, and there a, a typical issue was that um, people or the submissions very often came with that very strong uh, preconception of responsible management always needs to have an academic education business school angle 
it's something that doesn't really matter in the workplace. It doesn't happen there. So we actually had to uh, desk reject quite a big number of publications from the beginning just because there was such a narrow framing of what that actually could mean. Uh, and people would stay in their frame and wouldn't necessarily move out of it. So that's one of the issues that I've seen uh, very often also uh, recently publishing the, uh, uh, the research handbook of responsible management uh, or editing rather the research handbook of responsible management where uh, very often um, we, we as editors were very um, explicit in what we were looking for because there were so many other framings and preconceptions in the room that we had to, to move away from first before people could speak about, about what we thought was the core of the topic. And, and that's been an issue a little bit, yeah. yeah. And Colleen, I mean, what, what would a paper look like for you to be published in, mm. in society? As you say, you haven't published many so far. I can take responsibility for that as a, as a former editor of the journal. Um, yeah. What, what would they I've need to been, look like? Yeah, so this, is, this question has been living with me all week, really, as I've pondered this question coming up. And, I, it, and I'd, we would be interested in something that perhaps looked at um, maybe how accreditation stand, a critical discourse analysis of accreditation standards and whether then that feeds through, whether the management practices that that stimulates, the educate, management education practices that, that stimulates is about capture or whether there's a radical element there. Are there, are there new discourses being introduced into the business curriculum through things like standards? Um, another thing which I think would be really interesting to look at would be, business school, CEO, alumni interlocks. So occasionally you find these clusters of business organizations that are pioneers around doing something interesting in the CSR space or the governance space. Is, are there any interlocks between where these directors or CEOs went to school and was there something unique going on in that business school potentially? Um, or do we see any radical business schools moving outside of some kind of institutional frame where they, um, we, 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 we tend to have an assumption that most business schools teach fairly standardized types of MBA curricula. Um, the, there's a fairly standard set of functional academic departments. But what about mm -hmm. those business schools that do actually do something quite different? What's driven that? And what are those effects? further along in terms of how these CEOs might behave. Like Yale, for example, restructured their MBA curriculum about a decade ago away from functions around finance, marketing, accounting to, to having a stakeholder focus, which was team taught and collaborative taught from across the business school in these stakeholder oriented uh, modules and courses. So we would be quite interested then in how these business schools maintain some kind of legitimacy or gain some advantages by shit by sitting outside of those institutional norms and, and what effect that might have going forward. And also I think these interesting stuff, uh, perhaps a lost opportunity from the global financial crisis where a lot of the top business schools came under a lot of scrutiny for what it is that they're teaching and the effects that that had on how businesses were behaving. So did we see any change come out of that? Probably not really in terms of what's being taught in business schools. Why not? What were some of the drivers? What were some of the barriers to introducing that much broader institutional change in business schools despite that fierce and intense criticism. So they would probably be the sorts of things that we would we would entertain. I think one of the big challenges for us though, not least of all that theoretical contribution, is, is the temporal element. So a lot of what goes on in business schools that might be interesting, it's more interesting for us when it ends up being something that managers from those business schools might end up doing. And there's quite a lag obviously between when you finish your MBA and when you might be the CEO. So how you would reconcile that or, or bring that inside something that's relevant and interesting is challenging. Great. And Emma, I mean, from, from your point of view, what would a, an ideal article on this issue look like coming into management learning? What would you love to see that you haven't seen so far? So one of the features that we continually encourage authors to think about um, in submitting their work to management learning is the thought provoking or surprising aspects of the work. So it's not simply about demonstrating theory or having rigor in terms of methods or presenting empirical work that's been done. Um, it's also about saying something surprising and in an engaging and interesting way. And so the way that the article is written is also really important because 
because it influences whether people want to read it. And that obviously is the purpose of publishing. Um, so um, that's one thing is that, that that's a feature that, that needs to, to run through um, uh, uh, thinking in, in terms of submitting work to the journal, something we, we really encourage. Um, in terms of specific areas, um, we started to publish more and more work which looks at practice that, that takes a practice theory perspective uh, over recent years. It builds on a strong tradition in the journal um, and the relationship between learning and practice. Um, and I think that's going in some very interesting theoretical directions at the moment, particularly enabled by new materialist perspectives. And what they encourage is a way of thinking about um, major issues that we face today, like the pandemic and climate change, and, and moving beyond uh, um, the paradigm of language, moving beyond thinking of everything as, as, as a socially constructed process through language and actually bringing us back to the realities that we face, which this virus has has powerfully confronted us with. So uh, I would encourage um, engagement with with new materialist thinking that that um, there is some very interesting work in that space. Mm, great. I mean, for anyone that's listening in, I, mean, I think we had some really great um, examples there from the editors about the sorts of papers they'd love to see. Um, go out and write them now and the door is open on, on those sorts of topics. Um, what about then in terms of impact? So, you know, you're publishing lots of research. Uh, and this is the case you know, across um, management and, and, and business um, journals. How does that then feed into the classroom in terms of responsible management education? I mean, are there ways that um, journals should help feed things into the classroom? Are there particular articles that get picked up that end up in education or in learning in terms of organizations? Um, what's the kind of way that either your journals are dealing with that or that you think should happen better to translate the research that people are doing around this topic into the classroom? Oliver, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, I mean, very superficial ones there because uh, as mentioned, I haven't been in that role for long, but um, there, one of the interesting things that uh, we recently discussed in the editorial team was about um, the discrepancy between uh, how often papers are cited and how often they're downloaded. Very often the highly downloaded papers are not the ones which are highly cited. And uh, the, the, the kind of hunch uh, behind why that might be happening is that this might actually be the more valuable articles when it comes to, to using them in more practical situations, inclu including the classroom. So uh, what we are working on right now, and I, I understand I cannot uh, really give away the details at that point, but is uh, one format or one form at AMLD to capture this kind of dynamic um, of articles that might be very interesting and relevant for the classroom, but which are not represented in uh, the citation scores very well because their their contribution is a different one. Um, yeah, so I think this is probably the uh, the most relevant point. Yeah, and I think it's a great point, right? We're, um, it's so easy to get driven by the metrics that yeah. are available, but they capture such a thin slice of, of what's important. Yeah, um, and and the uptake of research in the classroom is one thing that's very hard to to yeah. track and measure and, and get some sense of of quantity on. Um, Colin, what about other areas of practice? What about you know turning into into business practice or policy? What are the ways that business society is is doing to try and increase that? Yeah, look, one of the things which we've been spending quite a bit of time thinking about this year has been around that question of impact. So you know we know that. It's really only academics that are reading our articles. Occasionally, there's something that will appear in the press. Um, there's blogs and there's tweets and and um, and so on. Often the blogs and tweets are, are really just talking to the same people. That Twitter is full of academics and, and so on, other keyboard warriors. But um, you yeah, know, sort of getting it out there is is certainly quite challenging. We've talked about what some of the, those different pieces might look like, what a commentary piece might look like, what shorter opinion and perspective pieces might look like. But I still think there's probably going to be a limited market for uh, the type of work that academics do. Um, and it's really then about finding those other ways to connect through um, blog posts, the conversation, for example, encouraging more academics to be writing in the conversation, using social media editors to 
turn some of the articles that are being produced by academics and journals into other media. And I think the business schools are driving a lot of this as well. The AACSB standards are much more focused on impact now and demonstrating that impact. Um, it, is, it, is a, it is a challenging space. I think the other thing is what we've been trying to do at the university, j just outside of business and society for a second, is to encourage more use of research um, amongst our students. You know, they often don't realize that we are writing academic journal articles, not just textbooks. So how we start to introduce what the value of that academic work is um, in the classroom. In running an, I've been running an MBA for the last six years. And one of the things which we tried to do in that space was to raise the literacy of students around knowledge. Um, and that there are different types of knowledges that play different roles in how we understand the world around us. A colleague of mine in, in New Zealand, Craig Pritchard, developed this nice framework that said, look, you know, there's, there's academic knowledge that we produce in journals and is produced by um, academics that has standards and norms and produced according to a certain set of conditions. There's, on, there's um, practitioner knowledge, which is knowledge that managers learn on the job. And there's popular knowledge that we might see in a bookstore um, around uh, uh, how to be a better manager. And then there's the kind of radical knowledge, the hysterical knowledge, which is that challenge to organisational thinking. So something that we tried to do in the MBA was to bring in the, the four different types of knowledges that float around as we make sense of organisational phenomena. So it, I don't think it's necessarily a question then of, always having to translate academic knowledge into something that's digestible, but more about raising the, lit the literacy of people to be able to engage with those different types of knowledges and understand the purpose and the contributions that they make. Great, I mean, we've got about 15 minutes left um, and there's been a very, very uh, active chat going on, uh, on on the side here. Uh, by the participants. And I think it'd be nice to bring in some of these questions and, and try and um, invoke some discussion around them um, while we have the opportunity. So if you do want to post some more questions, please do. And the first one I wanted to ask um, was from Dilip Merchandani. Um, and Dilip was asking that, you know, that as we push towards more exclusivity in journal publishing, right, as um, acceptance rates go, go down, are we replicating the kind of pyramid structure which promotes, you know, very limited forms of inclusion here. And does this then have a kind of negative effect on society and, on, and potentially also on the impact of our work? I know that Journal of Business Ethics uh, for a long time had this kind of idea to really open out the conversation, which is why they ended up with a, you know, a huge expanse of, of articles and sections and published a lot, a lot of work with a, with a view to increase the number of people that participate in the conversation. You know, is, is that a problem in this area that we're becoming more exclusive rather than inclusive? Emma, what are your thoughts on that? Yes, I think it is something that we have to be very mindful of. And we have to take into account that there's a reproductive effect through editorial boards and editors that um, has a self-fulfilling prophecy. So if you look at um, research that's been done looking at the composition of editorial boards, issues like gender and race matter in the composition of those they affect the work that's submitted, how it's interpreted, uh, the receptiveness of that journal to certain ideas and the relative importance that's placed on certain topics. So things shape people's ability to participate in the academic sphere and to have a voice within it. And it is um, skewed towards um, the West, towards um, white, white people and towards men currently. And I think we also have to think about um, the likely consequences of this pandemic. And there's been some research that's been done recently that has shown that women academics are taking the burden of care responsibilities already, such that the number of submissions that they're making to academic journals is going down already in weeks, in months. So these issues of people's ability to participate and what we do as editorial teams, as academic communities to make sure that there is a, a, a breadth of knowledge and a breadth of perspectives and, and experiences that are being heard is something that 
really um, we need to focus yeah, absolutely. on. Absolutely. I mean, Colin, I know that in um, your editorial, when the new team took over at Business and Society, you emphasised some of these issues about increasing participation of, of authors and, and editors um, based on gender, race and other things. What steps is Business and Society taking and, and what's the kind of challenge of that in terms of maintaining quality, increasing access or that, you know, that kind of balance that needs to take place? Yeah, I think the challenge is one of the big ones, which we've been debating quite a bit is, and, and I think really your question and, and Emma's response touches on this as well is, you know, is is this academic publishing, even the outreach efforts that we might make really just another form of colonization? You know, it's really about saying, sure, we will come and we'll run manuscript development workshops and we'll, we'll help you. But at the end of the day, it's still got to meet our standards. So I think that's one of the big debates that we're having at the moment, just about how we in a meaningful and, and in quite an authentic way do actually affect that um, idea of opening up more voices and in, in inclusion. And I think really it's about the engagement in those manuscript development workshops and attempting to really find those different spaces within the journal for those voices to be heard as well. Not everything has to be an academic um, article that makes a theoretical contribution. There are these perspective pieces and special issues, for example, are quite an easy way to bring in much more around mm. those types of perspective pieces as well. Um, it's also about engaging much more substantially with the doctoral students and understanding and working at that level in, in those processes. And it's going to be interesting just to see in this post-pandemic world how we are able to connect quite so easily across geographies to bring some of those voices out. The other thing which we've done quite a bit of work on is refreshing the editorial board and bringing in new associate editors as well to be more diverse. And I know that was something that you and your team, Andy, were very conscious about as well. And so starting to report some of those statistics when we're talking about the journal as well, um, the different regions that are represented, the different genders and, and other and, and other options uh, and ways to diversify the, the the leadership of the journal. Because I think that opens up those networks to enable those voices and to inform the editorial policies as well. Absolutely. Oh, another question that came up um, in, in the chat was about, specifically about undergrads and how can undergraduates uh, best get an opportunity for publishing. But I think we can even broad that out. So how, how do students, or early career researchers. So people who are just beginning in thinking about research, what opportunities do they have for getting published in, in mainstream journals like this? And what, what should they be doing to kind of increase their chances to improve their kind of access? Oliver, any thoughts on that? Yeah, maybe maybe myself being a rather junior academic, uh, sharing a little bit of my experience in part related to, to AMLE. Um, that um, I, I, I feel what has happened and, and connecting to Colin's point there about the uh, post-pandemic uh, kind of ways of work and connecting, uh, what was very helpful for me back then was really to uh, very repeatedly and very often to engage with a certain journal through the different workshops. Uh, so not just a one-off, uh, I've got a paper here and if it doesn't, uh, it's not gonna be published after this workshop, I go somewhere else. But to really build a community uh, around the journal. And I think this is much, much easier uh, as people get more used to, uh, to online formats uh, and don't have to have the travel budget to go to three different uh, 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 journal workshops uh, over two years or even over the same year. Um, so I think this is very helpful because then the, I think the quality or, or rather the potential of the manuscript uh, sent into the journal if it's a competitive, uh, to the workshop rather, if it's com uh, a competitive setting, well, probably it's more the, the quality of a junior, junior colleague's manuscript that decides if that person's going to be there rather than that person having the travel funding, which rather senior co uh, colleagues typically have. So I think that that might be an interesting development. And I think uh, as journals, we can do uh, a lot to foster that kind of um, that kind of dynamic by maybe even doing more workshops, but also being more mindful of papers that might not be uh, technically very well done just because people are not so experienced, but that might have a lot of potential and that potential could come out through a, a, a longer history of engagement between journal and uh, journal editors and, and the pay people who are publishing those papers. Good. Um, I think you know, the conversation about inclusion could, can go on for a long time. It's a, it's a vital 
conversation in important ones we're having now, especially. Um, but I want to also switch a little bit into a couple of the other questions just as we head towards the end of the session. One of them was about um, impact in particular, and Alec, Wors Alec Worson was asking about the recent Financial Times list of articles with impact and was questioning whether the panel had any thoughts on that, um, either as a good or a bad or, or, or a different kind of measure of potential impact. Uh, Colin, any thoughts? Um, uh, I'm not entirely sure what the qu question is necessarily getting at, but I think it kind of loops back through a, a couple of the other questions. And the more that, in coming back to the previous question about how more undergraduates or others can get involved, the more familiar people are with what academic research is and what academic work is, the more engaged they are, the better, I think. Um, so you know, so I think there's kind of- how to, how to achieve real world impact with with your yeah. research and how we might measure that. Financial Times had a, not exactly a ranking, but I think it was a top 100 articles that had real world impact. And mm -hmm. the was an out metric score. Mm. Yeah, I'd need to give that some more thought. Um, I'd be interested in the, in, in the panel's um, thoughts on that. I must admit I haven't seen the the ranking, so I don't really have any qualified comment there. Now we're on our own. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong answer. He's gone. Um, yes, he didn't like that answer at all. How about Emma? <laughs> Um, I think that uh, citation patterns and um, altmetric uh, patterns don't necessarily reflect the value of the work. They reflect the extent to which it's been promoted, and that is not a neutral process. Mm. There's some other interesting comments we could respond to in, in the chat box. Um, there was one um, which was around a concern that doing research in management education might adversely affect someone in the job market as people won't value that scholarship as much as oh. other research fields. I wonder if either of you've got any um, ideas on that. I think that's a, a valid point. We just carried on, sorry, Andy, without you and yes, took one of the comments. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> So, so that one I actually do have have, have an opinion on. I I want to say um, the I uh, okay I don't know where to start. I, I'm going to try to make it short. But um, I I feel that um, particularly the educational angle does, or at least in my my uh, um, case, has has limited to a certain degree where I could and would publish. Um, so and often it's very particular things like uh, Academy of Management uh, uh, annals. Uh, not accepting edu any education piece because whatever is education for an AOM journal goes always to AMLE. And, uh, but then also uh, Journal of Business Ethics, for instance, the, uh, uh, the ethics education uh, um, section is very narrow in the definition, or at least, at, le at least that's what it used to be in the past. So even if you're in education and in business ethics, you're not necessarily fitting in there. And uh, I, I, I myself found that quite limiting in the past and uh, have kind of migrated into non-educational topics as well to increase my chances. So I, I see uh, where Nathaniel there is, is coming from. Yeah, that was certainly one of the observations that as, as we talked about, you know, why we haven't published so much um, responsible uh, management, education, research, and business and society. And as I was asking others, they said, well, business schools just don't value it either. In a lot of cases, mm. they, mm. they want you to be publishing something in finance or publishing something in marketing or publishing something in your discipline. Um, and they, they just dismiss education focused research. So I think that is a big challenge. Well, on, on, the, on the upside, so though, I think they're, they're very good. And we've kind of yeah. gone over our go time ahead. a little, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, so let me call things to a close, if I can, and thank Emma Bell, Colin Higgins, and Oliver Lash for a you know, really wonderful conversation about some of the research challenges around responsible management education. And um, Thank you for all your chat and questions and um, resources and all the stuff you've been sharing on the side. 
and um, please do um, move along to the next session. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Andrew. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Thank Andrew. you, everybody. Thanks again for, for making that work on so short notice as well. I, I assume it wasn't very easy for you to, to kind of tie me in, in uh, either that short notice. No, no problem at all. Um, yeah? Yeah, well, it's, it, it helped that I kind of knew of your work already, so that certainly... Oh, I did. Okay, that's, uh, that's, that's very good to know. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, of course, I mean, actually, the first, uh, the first textbook I ever used was yours, so uh, um, the, the business ethics one. Ah, so uh, obviously I've been following you for quite a while. <laughs> yeah, well, you're, you're even getting the same haircut as me. Yeah, well, you, you know what? Uh, I realized 40 minutes to prepare was enough to cut my hair, not but not to cut my beard. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that, that happened. So, so hopefully there was something something helpful in there. No, that was great. Uh, Thank you so much for yeah, um, next staying. time. I would be more prepared. All right. Wonderful. Good talking to you. See you Thank then. You bye bye. Bye. bye.